This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. When you're traveling and ask a smart device for directions, it takes several seconds to respond. That latency is due to the processing needed to answer your question being housed at a data center. Your query may travel hundreds of miles away to be processed before it returns an answer. These data centers handle most of the heavy lifting for modern smart devices. The factory-sized servers use massive amounts of power in data centers around the globe. At MIT, NSF-supported researchers have created a new system that computes directly on these devices at teraflop rates. To learn more, we spoke with PhD candidate Alex Lutz, the lead author of this research. Alex, your project Netcast has fiber optic cables at its core. How does that process work? The first way we were able to communicate over long distances was actually using copper. So transatlantic telecommunications were done just at the start of the 1900s, uh, late 1800s, where we created these like hundreds, thousands kilometer long copper cables that spanned the ocean. Now the issues with those is those are slow. We could maybe send 10 symbols per second at most. And so getting data across to from, from the US to Europe, for example, took forever. We couldn't really send anything that wasn't crucial. As our requirement for bandwidth to communicate across the planet grew, we needed new physics to overcome those limitations of metal. And so that's actually where optics comes in, and in particular fiber optics, where we can take a strand of glass that's about as wide as a human hair. That strand of glass has the ability to carry a 10 terabit per second of data. To give you an idea how much data that is, that's as if I were sending uh, 10,000 full feature length movies per second in one strand of glass. That's that's remarkable. And actually we have you know, thousands, tens of thousands of these, these cables spanning across the world. And so there's been a trend over the last 20, 30 years to go from country to country to data center to data center, and then even like foot long interconnects just between chips to get as much bandwidth as we can to where it's needed. How are current voice assisted programs limited in processing power? If we want to be able to do machine learning and, and have a conversation with that voice assistant, we make a query and the device, our cell phone, is not really able to have enough computing power to actually run the machine learning model today. And so it takes the query, what is the height of Mount Everest, for example, and it ships it off somewhere else, namely to a data center. That process of offloading or shipping off the data is expensive. It costs a lot of energy to do that. We have to wait a long time in terms of latency because there's the, the time it takes to get to the data center for the data. And then you get to the end of, you, you arrive there and you get to the end of a queue of everyone else's information getting processed. And so because of that high latency cost, we're unable to run a lot of applications today. So for example, latency constrained applications like self-driving cars can't offload data. And so they need to do computation on the device itself on the, in the car or else they hit everything in their field of view when they're driving around. What role does artificial intelligence play in processing queries? In the last decade or so, we've had this revolution of artificial intelligence. This spawns from a paper where some researchers realized that they could use a combination of these really great algorithms, namely neural networks, and really good hardware, namely GPUs or graphical processing units. And by merging those together, they could train systems that can think or do classification of images far better than any other algorithm could before. And from that seed result a couple years ago, a whole field has emerged where now we have so many applications, voice classification, you know, speech recognition, processing image data, all of these applications are enabled by advances in AI, and that AI requires hardware to run the artificial intelligence model. How is Netcast approaching that process differently? We want to be able to run artificial intelligence models on devices like our cell phone or on self-driving cars. And the thing that's really hard about that today is we need to be able to take the artificial intelligence model, which is composed of many pieces of weight data. These are basically 2D arrays of numbers or floating point values arranged in what are called weight matrices, and be able to put those on the device itself. So what Netcast is doing is it's taking the heavy thing, the hard thing of this computation, which is moving the weight data around and keeping it local to the computer and putting it somewhere else. And so in particular, we move that weight data to a smart transceiver. This is a device that we've coined, which does all the heavy lifting of moving weight data and deploys it over an optical fiber to the edge device, where the edge device is now free of that heavy burden of moving that weight data and only needs a single active optical component to do the computing now. 
How did your practical testing work? It's easy enough to write things like an equation on paper and say, oh, this will work just fine. It's another thing to work through all the experimental details of saying there's no bug in the physics here. And to do that, we did kind of a demo in three parts. So first, to demo Netcast, we needed a smart transceiver, which can encode all the weight data we want. And so we had a smart transceiver made in a commercial CMOS foundry, the same kind of foundry that makes the chip inside your phone. And it can encode about 2.4 teraweights per second onto a single optical fiber. So that's, that's great. That's, you know, big, big chips able to, to encode all the data we can possibly think of. The second is we created a Boston area fiber test bed where we have a fiber that goes from our lab at MIT to MIT Lincoln Laboratory in Lexington, Massachusetts. This is a 86 kilometer fiber that's deployed in the real world and it snakes kind of throughout the Boston area before re making its way up to Lexington. And then on the other end of that fiber, we created a kind of proof of principle demo edge device, which consists of just one active optical component and then a couple of like off the shelf uh, fiber components to kind of split the light up and, and do measurements. Can you tell us about some of the results you got compared to present devices? If I were to try to make a digital computer, which to do edge computing um, inside of your cell phone, those computers typically consume about a picojoule of energy per multiplication at a system level. And that might not sound like a lot, but what ends up happening when you try to run these models is you need to do so much computing that that picojoule gets multiplied by some large number of multiplies you do, and suddenly it consumes many watts of power, which means your hand gets hot when you, you hold your cell phone and your battery drains very quickly. In our demonstration, we showed that using commercial silicon technologies, so no, no fancy new material, everything exists in many, many modern foundries today, we can lower that number by, a, by about a factor of 100 to 1,000. So that's, that's on the order of 1 to 10 femtojoule per multiplication. If you decided to incorporate new ideas and new materials, you could lower it much, much more too. In regards to how fast this can go, optical fiber has a lot of bandwidth. So we demonstrated three terahertz of bandwidth for computing, but you could push that much further. We estimate you could go to maybe 10 terahertz of bandwidth. There's other ways to scale this beyond that too. To put that in perspective, so we can rival the performance of those best-in-class NVIDIA GPUs using this architecture. How might Netcast be implemented? What's really great about the research we've done is it's really immediately applicable in the modern day. There are many devices, many of these edge devices that are kind of scattered around our daily lives. Really anything with a sensor, it needs intelligence today. We're taking that sensor data to try to make sense of the world around us and artificial intelligence is the best way we can make sense of the world around us today. And so you can imagine scenarios such as if I have cameras deployed on street poles, we can give it the computing power of the best computers by just running a fiber up the pole to that camera. Or you can imagine home Wi-Fi networks where we want to be able to use that radio frequency data to make sense of what's happening in the home. And we can it, it already essentially has a fiber connected to it. And so we can we can deploy weights over that fiber to that router and it can make sense of, of all that data that's coming into the router. Finally, how has the NSF's Graduate Research Fellowship Program impacted this work? I learned that it's really a quite remarkable opportunity to have more freedom in your academic research, and especially as a young researcher or graduate student, that's very important. What it's given me is the ability to make bolder risks in my research. We've kind of significantly uh, advanced science in this field as a result of that opportunity. Special thanks to Alex Sluds, Gino Scofidio, Adam Eggers, and Dina Headley. For The Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And if you like our program, share with a friend and consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.